Shea. I direct the Center for Religious Freedom at the Hudson Institute. And we are discussing today China's transnational repression against Americans' First Amendment freedoms. Transnational repression is an intrusion of sovereignty. It is also a human rights crime. And when it happens on American soils against American citizens and American residents, it is a constitutional violation of freedoms of religion and speech. For several decades, the Chinese Communist Party has been working to curtail these freedoms here in the United States. Um, it is purpose is to silence, uh, silence criticism and dissent, and also to control the ideological narrative in its own favor. And it's doing it around the world. Um, there were recent articles about Canada and the UK where this is happening, also Australia. But today's experts are going to be discussing how it is affecting uh, those of us in the United States. And those targeted include American citizens and American-based members of China's religious minorities, Falun Gong, the Tibetan Buddhists, the Uyghur Muslims, the Chinese Christians. It is also affecting and targeting um, critics and dissidents from Hong Kong and um, um, other uh, dissent groups, whether it's on COVID or um, on Tiananmen Square is a prominent example. And it is um, targeting officials and political officials and major cultural institutions and figures. So for example, um, Hollywood, uh, sports teams, uh, the uh, artists, students, and think tankers. And I was very uh, surprised to find out last week that I was myself a target of an attack, a hacking attack by Chinese state-backed hackers um, who uh, hacked the Microsoft servers, these super uh, secure servers around the world. And they drilled down into the Hudson Institute and accessed my own um, email accounts. And I was singled out in Hudson. And really what this tells me is that the Chinese Communist Party is as concerned and worried about um, America's free speech and religious freedom as it is about a trade and defense policy. So um, there are many various uh, tactics that the Chinese Communist Party uses to suppress these, uh, these freedoms here in the United States. And this is talking, again, about free speech and religious freedom. We're not going to get into um, other crimes like uh, 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 tech theft or intellectual property theft or, or just general spying. We're going to be quite specific. And these include uh, a whole roster of tactics like police stations, um, physical assaults, uh, campus Confucius institutes, a coerced repatriation, pressure on families back in China, bribes to government agencies, disinformation campaigns that are intended to ruin the, the, um, the, the reputations of politicians, um, canceling speakers um, on various, uh, at various venues and colleges, and then social media manipulation as well. And to discuss these and to discuss, to discuss these tactics, these issues, and the US policy response, um, I have joining me, and I'd like to welcome a very distinguished panel of experts. Um, on my left, we have uh, Levi Browdy, who's the National Executive Director of the Fallon Dafa uh, uh, Center. Um, on Zoom, we have Ian Oxnavad, who is um, with the National Association of Scholars. He's a senior fellow of foreign affairs and security. Um, immediately to my left is uh, Olivia Enos, a Washington director of the Committee for 
Freedom in Hong Kong Foundation. And then on the far end is Yin Chen, who's the conductor at the world-renowned Shen Yun Performing Arts. So welcome. Thank you. Um, Levi, I'd like to start with you. Uh, Falun Gong has been um, one of the prime targets of this kind of repression. It's a spiritual group um, that originated in China in the 1990s based on very traditional practices and values. And um, many of the practitioners are now here in the United States. Tell us what their experience has been. Sure. So as you mentioned, I mean, in the 90s, uh, Falun Gong was first introduced. It was very popular, 100 million people practicing. But at the end of the 90s, 1999, the communist leader ordered that the practice be stamped out, eliminated. And so for the last 24 years, we've been dealing with not only horrific persecution in China, but a lot of transnational oppression. And that really goes back more than two decades. I think what's interesting is if you look at just the last few months, both in April and May, um, there were two, three actually very high profile arrests by the FBI. Two individuals in April were, were arrested essentially for operating these undercover police stations at the behest of the Public Security Bureau in China. They had no permission to do this. Our, our officials didn't even know they were doing it. This was in New York. In New York and actually other cities around the US and, and around the world, they were started to find these police stations being run. Now, they were doing it under the guise of sort of helping the Chinese diaspora with their sort of acclimating to the, to the countries they were living in. But in reality, they were acting as covert operations to target dissident voices in this country and in other countries. Mm -hmm. And so they, they were arrested, these two individuals. And if you look at the indictment, this, the types of activities they were engaged in, I'll, I'll give you just a couple of examples. One was they were paying P Chinese people from different parts of the United States to bust them into Washington, D.C. to do a counter-protest against Falun Gong and silence the Falun Gong voices. Um, another thing the indictment mentions is they were asking them to get negative articles against Falun Gong in the press here in the United States. So these are the kinds of activities. And they were going after other groups, too. It wasn't just Falun Gong. These police stations were really targeting Hong Kongers. They were targeting Uyghurs, everybody. Fast forward one month, which uh, back in May of this year, two additional individuals were again arrested by the FBI. And in this case, what they were trying to do is bribe US officials, or what they thought US officials were US officials, it turned out to be uh, undercover FBI agents, in order to, in their words, topple Falun Gong. And they have, it's amazing, they have transcripts of their phone calls about how they're getting money from Tianjin, China, and their people in China so they can bribe these officials so they can go after Falun Gong in the United States. A very audacious move. Well, you're talking about the uh, bribe of the, attempted bribe of the Internal Revenue Service. Correct. Is that right? Correct. And that was to strip, the, the intent was to strip Falun Gong of its um, tax exempt status? That was a step one, uh, I'm sure, of a multi phased approach, but yes, it was to so strip, that, yeah, strip the tax exempt status. That's a clear yeah. example of religious repression, right. basically. Right. They're uh, essentially trying to get the US government to no longer recognize Falun Gong as a spiritual group. Mm -hmm. That's essentially what it was. Yeah. Um, and so those were very high profile arrests. They're going after these people. The problem is, that's really just the tip of the iceberg. And if you go back 24 years, I and mean, we've seen all kinds of things, particularly under two fronts that I'll mention. One is the physical assault front. I mean, right when the persecution started, I mean, literally days after, we had homes ransacked right here in Manhattan, or, or in Manhattan New York, where we were, we were living at the time, and just people being beat up on the streets. We had a whole mob of people, uh, a pro-Beijing group, attack Falun Gong people in New York City in 2008. Later on, the consul general himself was on the phone, and we recorded him admitting to egging these people on, that he was the one causing this. We've had people beaten up in the streets outside consulates in San Francisco, Chicago. Just this year, a young man was arrested for beating up Falun Gong people uh, in the streets of New York City. So this assault aspect, this thuggery aspect, is very much a part of the assault on people who, who voice something against the CCP. And, you know, I was reading in the last week, there's been a lot of more coming out on the police stations around the country here, uh, not just in Manhattan and in Chinatown, which was highly publicized in which the FBI then brought charges again, I guess, a, 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 an indictment against the mm -hmm. Department of Justice. Um, uh, do you think that these stations are... Uh, 
playing a role in coordinating or some of the leaders are, are, are involved in coordinating these assaults? They would have to be because one, what we know from the indictment is these individuals are actually directly under either the minister, minister of Public Security in China or other security apparatuses. In the case of the bribery case, they were talking about their, 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 their bosses in Tianjin. So they're, they're, under the direct, they're under the direction of CCP officials inside China. And they're the ones that are sort of giving them the orders about who to go after, and in the case of the bribery case, actually giving them the funds to do that. So this is a direct extension of the CCP on US soil, for sure. And what about some of these other tactics? Have um, I imagine some of your speakers have been canceled, or some of your events have been canceled. Is, uh, yeah, so, can you elaborate on that? Sure, and again, this goes all the way back to 1999. When the persecution, after a few months of the persecution, Jen Zemin and then President Bill Clinton were to meet at the APEC meeting. And the first thing that Jen Zemin did is hand him a big stack of propaganda books against Falun Gong. And from that day on, they did a similar thing to Condoleezza Rice several years later. And we've had that happen to multiple governors, senators, congresspeople, state legislatures. We had a, mayors across the city. All of them get phone calls, letters saying, don't support Falun Gong, don't investigate crimes of the persecution, such as forced organ harvesting. We had a mayor outside of San Diego many years ago who got one of these letters from the consulate in, the, in Los Angeles and said, you can't do this to me in my country. He held a press conference, held up the letter, said, this is the Chinese government telling me not to support Falun Gong right here in the US. We're going to support them even more. So it has brought, fortunately, a lot of uh, good stances uh, by your US officials uh, in many cases, but this has been going on for 20 years, and it's against all levels of our government to try and get them to ignore religious minorities like Falun Gong and others right mm -hmm. here in the US. Yeah, it brings to mind the uh, phenomenon of sanctioning of uh, uh, champions or defenders of religious freedom mm -hmm. for Chinese groups like Falun Gong. Um, I know that uh, uh, ambassador at large for religious freedom, Sam Brownback, was sanctioned, for example. My own colleague here at Hudson, um, s uh, former Secretary of State Mike Pompeo, um, was sanctioned, I believe, on the, his last day in office, the very day that he designated genocide against the Uyghur Muslims in China by the CCP. Um, I, I think that practically every uh, well, numerous commissioners on the U.S. Commission on International Religious Freedom have also been sanctioned. So um, there's a growing list of that. And it's because they have been speaking out for Falun Gong or one of the other groups um, involved in this. Uh, Congressman Chris Smith, uh, Senator Rubio, Senator Ted Cruz. Uh, these were the uh, top, some of the top people in Congress working on the executive uh, congressional um, Committee on, on, on uh, China and Human Rights, so th they have been sanctioned as well by China, meaning that they cannot get visas there, um, and they cannot be, um, there, there can be no business or company that in which they participate that ha can have business there in China. Um, so, um, uh, Ian, yeah, did you want to I just something? want to mention, and those, those tactics aren't ad hoc at all. If you go and you look, you know, we have a lot of leaked documents that have come out from the CCP over the years, some of which are speeches by high-level Chinese officials. And in particular, a speech in 2015 from who was then the head of the security apparatus says very directly about how to go after groups like Falun Gong in the U.S. And one of the things they say is strike and divide them from their own officials and people here in the West that would support them. So these, these tactics are not by accident. They are mandated largely by CCP officials in China. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, Ian, uh, you have done a lot of work, and the National Association of Scholars has done tremendous work in reporting on uh, attacks uh, by the CCP uh, uh, or orchestrated or led by or, or encouraged by the CCP on American college campuses. Can you tell us your findings, your main findings from your report? It's an extensive report, and, and it's, you've had several reports, so um, you know, feel free to give the, the, the greatest hits. Sure, there's plenty. Um, so this project began 
few years ago, uh, and our first report came out in 2017, where we actually started do started documenting Confucius Institutes and what they are, uh, and that was followed up by a follow up report on how Confucius Institutes uh, didn't really close so much as rebrand. Uh, after that, uh, now we are currently working on two current projects. One uh, relates to Confucius classrooms, which are Confucius Institutes at the K-12 level, as well as bilateral ad hoc science programs that are building between uh, Chinese universities. Many of them have ties to the Chinese military and their US counterparts. So this has been uh, a multi-phased multi, a multi -phased, uh, project uh, in which we're looking at China and Confucius Institutes. So Confucius Institutes are, for those who don't know, they're essentially Chinese language centers that were and are underwritten by the Chinese government. They're housed in foreign universities and colleges, but uh, they're basically essentially run by, by China. Originally, this was done through the Hanbon, which was the Chinese Ministry of Education's Office of mm -hmm. Chinese Language International. That was later uh, rebranded, but um, before it rebranded, and it, it oversaw 500 Confucius classrooms at the K-12 level. We're currently documenting more exact number of that. After a significant amount of public backlash, uh, Hanban was rebranded as the Ministry of Education Center for Language and Culture Exchange uh, and its own offshoot uh, specifically devoted to Confucius Institutes. Now, this rebranding was done to backlash, but the problem still exists. And Confucius Institutes are, were a problem, uh, we found out, simply put, because they're propaganda centers. Uh, in 2009, China openly admitted this. Um, Li Chang Chun, who is the head of the propaganda arm for the Chinese Communist Party, called C CIs uh, an important part of China's overseas propaganda setup. They're, they made, you know, this is completely transparent. Now, we actually found four main problems in our first report in terms of how Confucius Institutes erode their, you know, educational sovereignty and constitutional protections in the U.S. Uh, the first was the erosion of intellectual freedom. Uh, Confucius Institutes have to adhere to Chinese legal standards of speech codes and propaganda standards. This obviously flies in the face of the First Amendment, um, and it's also an erosion of, of uh, educational sovereignty. But, for example, things like the Falun Gong, it's a taboo topic, the Tiananmen Square Massacre, discussions of religious minorities, treatment of the Uyghurs, uh, Taiwan, uh, democracy groups in Hong Kong, all of those were considered taboo topics. Uh, and this was a big issue uh, that we found out in the sense that you had a number of Chinese dissidents as well uh, who were supposedly monitored through the, the Confucius Institute apparatus. We found a problem of transparency, uh, conflict uh, contracts between China and U.S. universities uh, were often unknown to the public. Uh, oftentimes, the, the conditions of contracts were revealed after they had been signed. Uh, we also saw the issue of entanglement in the sense that the Confucius Institutes offered China uh, basically a base within a number of American universities by which to conduct a whole host of operations, everything from soft power, which was the other uh, big issue that we discovered uh, in, certain, in the sense that these are propaganda machines, but also, you know, more nefariously, potentially, the, that offers China a base to conduct other things, uh, whether it's the extraction of dual-use technologies, the theft of intellectual property, at Western Kentucky University, uh, a professor who had gone to China from Western Kentucky had a uh, flash drive that had been manipulated. And it was actually found out that if she had plugged that in when she had returned home, it would have uh, corrupted the entire school's uh, cyber system. So the, those were the big areas that we, that we found. Uh, at their height, there were 118 of these institutes. There's currently only nine left. And when you look at universities that have them, colleges, the number is significantly smaller. Many were shut down um, as the result of backlash. Others were simply spun off into nonprofits uh, or either independent of their university hosts. Others were simply absorbed um, by the by the universities themselves and were run independently. Yeah, uh, I, in terms of, I, yeah, I, yeah I was really uh, surprised to read your report and find out that there was actually money going to these universities from these institutes and these uh, uh, societies, that there was an incentive, every incentive for the, for the university to 
um, then be very cautious about criticizing China because they knew that the red lines, what the red lines were, the ones that you mentioned. I, I know that I, I think it was North Carolina State University canceled the Dalai Lama um, after uh, some pressure. I know, I know GW, George Washington University, actually had a good outcome, uh, but initially the president uh, was asked to cancel an art, a poster of uh, political protest posters uh, during COVID against the CCP. And um, a, a group of Chinese students came up and said, take them down, that this is um, uh, uh, hate speech, a form of hate speech against um, Asian Americans. And the president, you know, the administration immediately took them down. When they were pointed out, uh, when it was pointed out to them, though, to their credit, that these were actually political protests, legitimate political protests, um, the president of GW uh, allowed them to come back up. But um, uh, how prevalent is that? What did the universities get out of these uh, associations, uh, apart from some kind of money that we're really not sure what the amount is because there's no transparency? Yeah. So in terms of dollar amounts, it, it varied um, a lot. Oftentimes it was around a hundred thousand and that may not seem like very much, uh, but when you add in other aspects, like in one case, there was an entire building that was constructed, uh, devoted to the Confucius Institute. Uh, it's considerable. Now the universities from their standpoint, because a lot of countries have programs like this, but they're not designed for uh, political warfare, which is a concept that the U.S. doesn't really understand uh, in the West, really, although it's a centerpiece of the Chinese Communist Party. Uh, the universities get prestige, international prestige, and they get funding. So if you're a, a small college, and these things are all over the place, uh, if you're a small college in, you know, in the Midwest, and you don't have a lot of international ties, the Chinese Communist Party comes in, offers you a free you know, language program, uh, that's, that gives you international prestige. It also gives you a program to offer that doesn't have uh, any upfront costs from you necessarily. And these, the teachers in the Confucius Institutes uh, were from China and they were handpicked by China. These are not uh, locally trained American professors uh, who, who happen to be Mandarin speakers. These are picked by the government and sent over. So, uh, and this was happening very prevalently across all of them. So, yeah. And uh, did they um, organize the students to go after other students? I'm aware that, for example, in Purdue University, uh, there was a student, a grad student, a couple of years ago who um, had a social media post um, sympathetic to the uh, victims of Tiananmen Square on its anniversary. And other students um, denounced him not only to his face or to his um, account, social media account, um, but also to the CCP back home or the Ministry of Public Security back home, which then visited his family. And um, the president of Purdue at the time, Mitch Daniels, um, uh, wrote uh, that this is not acceptable and any kind of encroachment or infringement of freedom of speech on a part of, uh, um, from one student against another, or a group of students in that case, against another was absolutely unacceptable. Everybody had free speech in, in the university community. Uh, again, another good positive example. Um, but do you have any sense of whether they enlist students to um, enforce their red lines against other students or teachers? So something that I don't think the US has really grasped uh, and, so, and other countries are starting to pick up on this because Confucius Institutes are not unique to the US. There's a lot of hostility towards these institutes in other countries and increasing suspicion uh, in Australia, India, places in Europe as well. Um, but something to keep in mind is that the Chinese uh, language teachers that China sends over and many of the students who are probably not uh, attending Confucius Institutes, but are from China. Uh, the Chinese government knows that they're there. They're, this isn't like, you know, in the U.S. where if somebody wants to go to Italy for a semester, you know, the government probably is not going to keep track of them. Uh, hopefully not. In China, that's not the case. Uh, China knows 
uh, who who is going, and and oftentimes they you know they're sent to specific programs potentially. Um, when you're looking at this, this is one of the big issues: is that that it's not innocuous. This is not the students doing it themselves. The Chinese government is involved in every step of the way, uh, and one thing that American academia doesn't seem to understand is that there's no such thing as a private university in China. These are all government connected, uh, oftentimes military connected uh, institutions that they're partnering with. Okay, we'll get back in a minute about what can be done about this, but I wanted to give Ying Chen um, a, a platform now to talk about uh, Shen Yun and, and, and what you've experienced as uh, one of the conductors there. And um, I must say, I think it was a beautiful performance. I've seen it a couple times now at the Kennedy Center here in Washington, DC. Um, and it is uh, available. Uh, it, it, it performs in major theaters around the country and around the world. So um, I'm surprised to hear, I'm shocked, that you have encountered this firsthand. Please tell mm -hmm. us about it. Thank you. Um, maybe before I talk about the, the specific incidents, I can first quickly touch on why. I think a lot of people may, may wonder why the CCP may actually go after a performing arts group in the first place. Um, so for those of you who have seen Shen Yun, we, our, our um, mission is to show to the world the authentic uh, traditional culture that's untainted by communism. Uh, because we feel that the culture has been lost after the com communist regime took over China for the last several decades. So in Shen Yun's performances, um, you see, you know, beyond the be beautiful dances and wonderful music and gorgeous costumes, we also try to um, get our audiences a chance to experience the spirit and traditional values of China. However, some of those values and beliefs are exactly what the communist party has tried to eradicate for decades mm -hmm. so that they can fortify their rule. Um, the, the most striking example is the matter of um, spirituality. But Chinese civilization has always been spiritual. For thousands of years, um, the, the, for example, the three key, uh, the, the three principal are, uh, religions and uh, philosophies in China, Confucianism, uh, Buddhism, Taoism, are considered the three pillars of Chinese society. And their uh, beliefs and their ideas have been deeply rooted um, and immersed into the Chinese belief system for, for, for thousands of years. So in order for um, the Communist Party to gain control over people's heart and mind, they have tried to stamp out those values and in, in, through the Cultural Revolution and, and all of that. And ours, therefore, um, of course, have been heavily censored in China. But here, Shen Yun Performing Arts was created in New York, and um, we have refused to be subjugated by the CCP because the whole point of creating this company was so that we can uh, really show people China's authentic culture uh, without the communist influence, right? So in our performances, we will include stories about, for example, the classic, based on the classic novel, Journey to the West, but we will underline um, the spiritual theme. Um, we bring out the spir spiritual theme that's, that's underlying uh, instead of just the superficial antics because that whole journey is really a metaphor for a spiritual path. And we also have stories that include um, uh, show divine intervention coming to help those who keep their faith and integrity in the face of uh, adversity. And we certainly expose some of the human, human rights crimes that the CCP is still perpetrating today as we speak. None of, none of this that you've described is acceptable at all to the CCP. If, of course. Yes, the yeah. values, the traditions. Yeah all must be cast aside. Exactly, for, exactly. For CCP, for communist, Chinese communist ideology and values. Right, that, right. That's actually part of the sinicization program um, against religion mm -hmm. of the Chinese Communist Party. Right. So obviously, you know, you can see why they, they are hostile towards Shen Yun. And because now, uh, especially with Shen Yun's enormous impact and, and growth, now we have eight companies touring around the world, reaching over a million people each year. Uh, so that only heightens CCP's fear and, and hatred toward us. So um, 
as a result, as you can imagine, for the last, uh, over the years, they have pulled all kinds of tactics to stop us from performing. Uh, some of the, uh, some of the, one example is um, they've tried to actually tamper with Shen Yun's vehicles. Um, one example is in Ottawa to 2010, uh, one of our bus drivers discovered a strange mark on the front tire of the dancer's bus. And the bus service personnel told us later on that the cut was, uh, the slashes were definitely made by a blade. And it was done in a way that the tire would not go flat right away. But once the bus is running and gets heated and expands, it would burst. And so given that it's dangerous, a, of course, tire it's, slashing of a bus. Yeah, it's dancers. a front tire, so the, the the bus will lose control, and with forty some people on board, mm -hmm. and also probably not a coincidence. Three days after that, um, another bus, uh, the tire of another Shenyun bus, actually burst uh, while traveling, and two days after that, slashes were found on the tire of another Shenyun truck. So since then, we actually have to had all of our buses and trucks watched around the clock, everywhere we go, every year when we tour. Can you imagine that? It's, um, so, of course, you know, and we always have to be careful uh, because we could be watched and, uh, you know, and, and just we ask all the members to just try to stay together uh, to, to make sure everybody's safety. Mm -hmm. uh, and another thing that they've also done very commonly is to... Uh, just about every theater that we've performed in have received calls, letters, like I mentioned, calls, letters, uh, sometimes visits, emails uh, by the Chinese consulate or uh, embassy nearby, uh, slandering us and pressuring them to cancel our performance or not let us perform there. Um, in, in Arkansas, in Little Rock, Arkansas, for example, the Robinson Center Music Hall received a 13-page letter from the Houston Chinese consulate uh, asking them to deny Shen Yun's application uh, to perform there. And the theater manager, of course, said, <laughs> you have no right to tell me what to do here. And he submitted a letter to the FBI. And um, In Little Rock. In Little Rock, Arkansas. Arkansas, yeah. So this is very prevalent. Not, we're not just talking about New York or Los Angeles. Uh, it's very prevalent. You can strike anywhere. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And um, Levi, feel free to jump in on this, but um, I also met um, a woman and a dancer whose mother was actually jailed back in China after he started dancing. Mm. And so you're facing that kind of pressure as well. Absolutely. I myself have family members who were persecuted, <laughs> who experienced mm. persecution. My parents, they were both members of the Central Philharmonic Orchestra. And... Um, yeah, they were uh, in their 70s, and they were thrown into detention centers just because of their faith. Uh, mm. For my, my mom, multiple twice, and my brother was thrown into a labor camp for 18 months and endured torture. And you know, thankfully, he survived there. Mm. And just another dan uh, one of our principal dancers, Stephen Wong, his mother was just sentenced to four years in prison. And this is, she is already 69 years old. And so before, she's in China and he is here, yeah, part exactly. of the dancing troupe of yes. Shen Yun. Yes, and she was arrested 11 times prior to this and spent about eight years in various detention facilities because of her faith. And many of our members uh, they have, that have family uh, in China, they're getting uh, regular visits from the security, you know, the national security group, uh, pressuring them and saying that, oh, we know your daughter is performing with Shen Yun. You better ask, him, ask her to stop. Well, it's been 24 years since um, the uh, president of China vowed to eradicate Falun Gong, and yeah. they're still around. Yeah. And um, I know they established uh, an infrastructure, the 610 offices at every level of the bureaucracy and the, both in the government and the party to make sure that happened, and it hasn't happened. So yeah, because, um, they because, keep trying. Ex yeah, because what they try to stamp out, like I mentioned earlier, is to control people's mind and heart. But we are, um, if you have faith and you have you know, integrity and you don't want to be subjected to that, then we're, we're continue to thrive, I think. <laughs> yeah. 
I just wanted to add, I mean, where the Shenyan Performing Arts trains is, is upstate New York, and it's, it's a it's a 400 acre campus that has both Shenyun, it's got an academy and a college, it's got Buddhist temples, and that site, as you can imagine, has been the, the target of constant surveillance, low-flying airplanes, drones. We had, early in the early days, we had consulate vehicles with consulate um, license plates driving up to the, to the campus, taking pictures of everybody, intimidating people. Um, for a while, there was even a high-definition camera pointing at the exits and entrances to this campus with the intent of getting pictures of whoever's going in and out, because whoever is, that picture can, can then be sent back to China and get that person's family in trouble. So mm -hmm. that, that campus where Shenyun rehearses is very much a target for the same type of tactics. Mm -hmm. yeah. So, Olivia, turning to you, what are you? What can you add to this discussion at this point? Yeah, well, I mean, I think there can be no doubt that Hong Kongers are being increasingly targeted by the Chinese Communist Party and even by their own government, the Hong Kong government. Um, in early July, at the anniversary, the third year anniversary of the national security law, the law that essentially eliminated all forms of civil and political liberties in the city state, um, the chief executive, John Lee, and his Hong Kong cronies um, issued a bounty on the heads of eight Hong Kongers. Mm -hmm. Three of those eight individuals are based here in the US. Um, the other three are based in the UK, and the other two are in Australia. What was the price? It was <laughs> Hong Kong one million dollars, which in U.S. dollars is about one hundred and twenty-eight thousand per person. per person, and so this is a blatant application of the national security law in an extraterritorial way. Each of these individuals is accused of so-called colluding with foreign forces, mm -hmm. and I want to be abundantly clear about what colluding with foreign forces means. It's something as simple as a Hong Konger coming and meeting with you or I, any of us mm -hmm. here. Um, maybe going and briefing a member of Congress or speaking or giving a media interview. These are simple things that are considered fundamental freedoms, basic rights in any other context, and yet they're being criminalized by the Hong Kong government. And I think that it's becoming increasingly difficult for us to discern between the Chinese Communist Party itself and Hong Kong authorities. It used to be very, very different. And now I think it's it's basically the same. And it demonstrates just how far Hong Kong has truly fallen from grace. So I think this is a really vivid, you know, up close and personal example of what the Hong Kong government is doing now to transnationally repress overseas activists who are standing on the side of freedom. But there are other forms that are truly horrifying, um, forms of intimidation and spying um, that my own colleague at the Committee for Freedom in Hong Kong Foundation, Frances Hoy, has experienced herself. Um, when she was in college, she organized a protest in support of the 2019 uh, pro-democracy protest. College here in the United this States. This is a college here in the US in Boston. And she organized this protest. And ahead of the protest, she received messages from a Chinese American individual saying, we will bring guns to this protest threatening her very life um, for organizing this protest. And then subsequently, this gentleman, along with several other um, Chinese Americans, organized a counter protest and used it as an opportunity, as you were mentioning, to surveil and to take note of who's participating, who's not. How can we intimidate their families back home? One of the gentlemen who was um, involved in this was actually indicted by the DOJ for his targeting of Hong Kongers and of uh, Chinese individuals in the US in general. So it was good to see a positive response to that. But there are still individuals like the one threatening to use the guns against my colleague who have not seen justice. So it was a shadow war that um, our officials aren't really alert to, and our university officials yeah. um, are not alert to what, what Ian has just said. And this is happening to college students, right? You know, These are not established professionals. Um, they're not even necessarily super well known. These can be ordinary people who are standing on the side of freedom, but that's viewed as threatening. Um, I guess um, they're going after colleges. They're targeting colleges, because it is just such a soft target. I think that's absolutely right, and I think 
because colleges and students so quickly mobilize and, and they see the value of freedom of speech. Um, and they're, they're willing to use that and to associate in important ways. But it's, it's not only college campuses. Mm -hmm. um, there was a really shocking event that occurred last fall. Um, this was in uh, Manchester, United Kingdom, where Bob Chan, a, a Hong Konger who was in the UK, was uh, participating in a protest mm -hmm. outside of the Manchester consulate. He was dragged by consular officials in Manchester, Chinese consular officials in yeah. Manchester, yeah, onto the consulate grounds, and he was physically beat up, physically. And the UK didn't expel them. I think there was a lot of confusion around this event. The UK government did not expel um, the consular officials. Instead, the UK had requested to interview them, to call them into the police station, and the Chinese government dismissed them. So those consular officials, including the consul general, ultimately went home to China, but not because there was necessarily a strong Western response and an immediate mm -hmm. denouncement, but rather because the Chinese government was sort of fearful. And, and again, I think this is emblematic of just how far um, Chinese officials will go. They're on foreign territory, and they're beating up individuals who are standing on the side of freedom. Um, and, you know, I think that it's incredible that, you know, these are not the only events. Family members who are left behind in China, as you were saying, they're facing intimidation. Yeah, I saw that Nathan Law, who's a very well-known uh, Hong Kong uh, political opposition leader, yeah. uh, I think he was a member of the legislature. Yes, he was a member of the LegCo and just very prominent um, activist uh, in general, and he's based now in the UK. His family members um, were called in for questioning in the middle of the night. Mm -hmm. And you know, these sort of intimidation tactics happen to individuals, whether you're a high profile person like Nathan or you're just, you know, an ordinary person who's saying, you know, we want to see freedom in Hong Kong. Uh, we wanted to continue to see the preservation of Hong Kong's autonomy, mm -hmm. but obviously the CCP broke their promise in some some really, really important ways. And you know, I guess I, I would just conclude by saying that, you know, a, a lot of times um, we think of these as being, you know, oh, only high profile individuals are being targeted, but it's any Chinese person and even non-Chinese people. Who makes the public enough statement. Yeah, yeah. 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 And I think that suspicion. it speaks to the fact that the Chinese Communist Party um, fears its own people, fears ideas of freedom being proliferated, and this the, the intimidation tactics that they engage in, these are further proofs, not of the strength of the Chinese Communist mm -hmm. Party, but of its weakness and of its vulnerability. And so mm -hmm. I think the irony in all of these activities, like the mm -hmm. targeting of the Hong Kongers with the bounties and otherwise is that, you know, they're seeking to intimidate in silence. They're truly emboldening. Mm -hmm. you know, people yeah. are more dedicated than ever to ensuring um, you know, freedom and the preservation of their ways of life than ever before. And the Chinese Communist Party needs to realize, like, people are not going to back down. Yeah, mm -hmm. I mean, we really need to make their example of all these heroes um, who speak out known and their yeah. names known. And uh, what do you think, I'm, I'm going to ask everyone this, but Olivia, I'll keep with you on this discussion of Hong Kong. What more should the U.S. be doing um, to protect the Hong Kongers who are here? Yeah, well, I mean, I think there's so much that can and should be done. For me, it's been encouraging to see that the DOJ has been targeting people. There have been indictments that have been issued for individuals that are targeting Hong Kongers, targeting activists um, you know, around China in general. Um, and I think we, not just the US, but the UK, um, other uh, Asian allies like Japan and Korea, uh, Australia, and elsewhere, those who value freedom need to say, we're going to use our legal and judicial systems that are fair and just to hold these individuals to account. So I think we need to use the full lengths of our legal and judicial systems in the ways that we can. I also think that we need to offer safe haven to individuals who are fleeing persecution. Yeah, that's a good point. Um, you know, and when we offer safe haven, we need to be able to offer security guarantees mm -hmm. to individuals. If you are being targeted by the Chinese Communist Party, we're going to come to your defense, whether you're here on an asylum claim, you're a refugee, um, or you're a legal permanent resident or citizen. We're here standing by you to make sure that the perpetrator is held accountable. And I think you know, some ways that we can do that in the very short term, um, 
let's use sanctions to their fullest extent. Mm -hmm. You know, I think um, the Ministry of State Security has come up in this conversation, but the United Front Work Department is mm -hmm. another one that is mm -hmm. constantly. That's the propaganda arm the of propaganda. the Chinese Communist Party. Exactly, they are constantly acting. And to my knowledge, I was, I was looking this up last night, the former head of the United Front Work Department, Yu Quan, he was actually sanctioned for the role that he played in architecting the national security law and overseeing its implementation mm -hmm. in Hong Kong. But he has since left that position, and there's a new individual in that position who, to my knowledge, is not sanctioned by the U.S. government. That should be remedied. Easy, good, easy target. Good recommendation. <laughs> we'll run with that. <laughs> easy target uh, right there. And I think anyone who is engaging in severe transnational repression overseeing it should be considered for a tranche of sanctions, whether that's under Global mm -hmm. Magnitsky or other authorities. Yeah, and I think that a simple demarche might help, too, in some of these cases. That is, just going to the embassy and the consulate every time, at a high level, going every time that there is uh, an intimidation or harassment. Yeah. Or spying. Um, I know there's been spying on the National Mall of you know people who've come from. A, actually, it was a Christian family from mm -hmm. Xinjiang who came and got political asylum, and they were uh, trailed while walking, pushing a baby carriage on the mall, and um, and photographed. Wow, that's so. Um, yeah, and you... and I just wanted to add one other thing on sanctions. If the U.S. issues sanctions, if any country for that matter issues sanctions against China, we can't let up on them. There's consideration of inviting Hong Kong's chief executive, John Lee, to the APEC summit later this year in November. Um, and he would be on US grounds in San Francisco. He's a sanctioned individual. Mm. We can't allow that to happen, especially not after he's targeting individuals here on US soil. So I think we need to stand a firm line when it comes to all of this. Mm -hmm. good, good recommendation. Ian, I'd like to ask you about what you think the U.S. could be doing or what the campuses could be doing more, or what they've done good, you know, what, what, what they could do better. Well, in terms of the campuses, there's really uh, nothing positive to report, unfortunately. Um, uh, in terms of China more generally, I think there needs to be a shift in mindset uh, outside of China, that, or especially in the U.S., that China that helped the U.S. win World War II is not represented by the CCP. Uh, and there has to be a general uh, thinking shift in terms of what does a CCP free China look like mm -hmm. and support uh, dissident groups that are working towards that goal. For the universities themselves, uh, there's a number of things that should be done because the foreign influence on American campuses from authoritarian regimes is actually pretty considerable. Uh, and we found that uh, governments in the Middle East, uh, Iran, Saudi Arabia, uh, they have a significant presence on campus as well. Uh, Russia, uh, believe it or not, has uh, US, U.S. universities have helped them develop cyber capacity uh, over the past few years and lead up to the, to the war in Ukraine uh, when sanctions actually start to take effect there. So from the university standpoint, uh, the legal regime in the U.S. has to change in order to dissuade American universities from making these relationships in the first place. Um, so in one of our reports, we recommended uh, stringent uh, enforcement of Section 117, which is reporting requirements for foreign gifts. Um, we have since put out follow-up uh, policy recommendations uh, that go farther than this. One is the idea of ratio funding, which is this basic idea that for every um, foreign dollar from any source that an American university obtains, that's one less tax dollar for which it is eligible. And this would include foreign tuition. Uh, and that would actually create, uh, a, basically change the game for American universities in terms of how much they are willing to accept uh, money from outside. No, that's uh, beyond that, beyond that uh, changing the Foreign Agent Registration Act to close educational loopholes is an absolute mm -hmm. must uh, because education, mm -hmm. research, and artistic uh, loopholes exist in FARA. And these are the same loopholes that exist uh, for universities. Uh, other powers have interest in our fundamental research because we do develop uh, you know, high technology, pharmaceuticals, everything of uh, scientific nature that has a dual use purpose for either commerce or defense. And at the same time, uh, whoever graduates our universities are ultimately probably gonna become policymakers at some point. So uh, do you really want the CCP uh, having a presence in classrooms uh, shaping the views of future policymakers? Uh, probably not. You wouldn't, we wouldn't have wanted that with the Soviet Union. We certainly wouldn't have wanted that with Nazi Germany. So why are we doing that with the, the CCP? 
uh, that's that's a good question. Uh, so those are those are two things uh, that we have we have suggested. Another is um, taxing endowments uh, that that have aspects of foreign investment uh, tied to authoritarian regimes. We've also floated that idea as well. Yeah, the um, CCP has been a very clever at using our own um, cultural arguments against us, and that's a conversation for another day, and we'll, we'll get to that. But um, if there is any type of a pushback to uh, the CCP's encroachment on campuses, I've noticed there's a, um, a quick response of hate speech, um, you know, that this is anti-Asian hate that's um, uh, causing the pushback to uh, the CCP aggression or point of view that's being uh, promoted. So we yeah, have to be aware of that as well, that mm -hmm. they understand how we think in a way, or what our national dialogue is, mm -hmm. and will try to manipulate that to their own well, advantage. Well, that's, 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 of course, part of it. And, and one of the comebacks to that is, if it's really anti-Chinese, how come there are no protests against Taiwan at the same time? Uh, it seems to be only the one China that's run by the CCP that's actually being criticized, uh, not not the Chinese people, not the Chinese culture. Uh, we, and again, this has to be differentiated. Uh, you know, the Soviet Union was not necessarily the same as Russia. Uh, the Nazis were, did not necessarily represent Germany. Uh, the CCP has no right to represent China either. Very good. Some good ideas there. Um, Levi and Ying, I'll give you the last word. <laughs> Go ahead. <laughs> um, I would say uh, three quick things. One, we need to be much more aggressive at expelling diplomats. Um, you think about what happened in the case I mentioned in New York City. We caught on tape a Chinese consul general admitting to egging on people to attack Falun Gong in the streets of New York. Nothing happened to him. Mm. Um, he was eventually recalled to China, but nothing happened to him. We need to expel those people quickly. Second thing is we need to investigate pro-Beijing groups here in America. Um, Ian mentioned a very good point. There's no such thing as a, as a private university in China. Well, there's no such thing as a, a pro-Beijing non-governmental organization here in the US. They all have ties to China. The money is flowing. They're getting direction. We really need to investigate those groups vigorously and find out what they're doing, making sure they're registering for FAR or any other requirements that they have. The third thing I would mention is the US government needs to be meeting regularly with people in the United States that are on the front lines of this transnational oppression, the people who are being, uh, who are, who are being victimized by it, who are seeing it, the Ying Chen's of the world, because the tactics and the, and the multifaceted nature of what the CCP is doing right here on U.S. soil is way beyond what, the, honestly, the U.S. government is understanding or capable right now. And in order to get up to speed, in order to get ahead of that curve, they need to be speak, speaking to the people who are being targeted, and they'll be much more adept at, at rising to that challenge. Well, these are all excellent <clears throat> policy recommendations, and I really want to thank our expert panelists. We're out of time right now, but we are going to revisit some of these issues, and we'll be soon holding a discussion, um, airing a discussion, uh, especially drilling down on campuses. And Ian Oxnavod will be with us then, as well as another uh, expert. So thank you all very much for joining us today. Mm -hmm. It's a very important discussion we need to start waking up. Thank you. Thank you.